Hey Karen, thanks for uh, that video and um, telling me about that conference that's coming up. It sounds really interesting and I'll probably end up buying uh, the book that results. Um, I uh, also read that uh, essay by Jerry Fodor about uh, adaptationism and um, you know I suppose I agree somewhat. I mean I don't think that we're going to find the natural selection as a theory is incorrect. You know, it's not going to be disproven. I think what's going to happen is something similar to what happened to Newton's laws in light of Einstein's new formulation, which is they weren't exactly wrong. They certainly still applied well um, to the features of the physical world that they were meant to explain and describe, but uh, Einstein found larger, more all-encompassing uh, equations that uh, explained more and I think a similar thing will happen when we understand epigenetics and the laws of form a bit better um, they will sort of give us a new way of understanding the larger co larger context within which natural selection works um, I think uh, Stuart Kaufman puts it well when he says self-organization mingles with natural selection in barely understood ways to yield the magnificence of our teeming biosphere um, so in other words natural selection calls patterns of organization that emerge um, from the natural complexity of, of systems they don't need millions of years of evolution um, and it's it's the order that comes from this emergence of complex interactions um, that explains the form of biological systems natural selection merely selects from those which don't work um, so you know in other words natural selection tells you what doesn't work it doesn't provide the order and the form of that which does um, now I do agree wholeheartedly with Fodor though when he criticizes evolutionary psychology um, because it's there that we're trying to apply Darwin's theory to culture to human consciousness human behavior and interaction and it, this just it's too greedy it's too uh, it's what Dennett would call greedy reductionism um, in that it's trying to reduce uh, teleology or purpose and meaning which I think you know most human beings agree is is a real uh, aspect of our lives and our interaction with one another our ethics and our morals it's trying to reduce that to uh, a material cause where it's just a bunch of blind parts interacting um, and accidentally stumbling upon um, you know adaptable uh, mechanisms of survival or gene mutation being selected by the environment there's more involved in human interaction and you know as epigenetics is is showing already there's more involved in in animal interaction than than just um, genetic mutation and selection um, and you know I think what's what's happened in science at least the more greedy forms of reductionistic science is that we've reduced uh, causality to a single type of causality which um, Aristotle called material causes which is where the parts um, cause the whole to exhibit whatever behavior it does um, there are three other types of causes though that Aristotle distinguished um, there's uh, formal causes which is what uh, the laws of form really amounts to and that's um, when the whole causes the parts to behave in a certain way so it's the exact reverse of material causation where the parts cause the whole formal causation is when the whole causes the parts and that's what we're trying to understand when we look at the development of, of organisms um, there's also efficient causes which is um, you know where a thing came from that from which the change first starts and Kaufman also pointed out um, that uh, Darwin's book The Origin of Species 
doesn't actually say anything about the origin of life. Um, he still resorts to the, the theistic metaphor that the Creator breathed life into the first form um, or few forms which then diversified due to natural selection. So Darwin didn't know, and we still don't know, how life originated. Um, so we need to focus on uh, efficient causation to get that answer. We cannot focus solely on material causation and expect to understand the origin of life. Um, just as we cannot focus exclusively on material causation and expect to understand uh, the laws of form. Um, and when it comes to human cult culture, there's... Uh, final causes which involve teleology, purpose, reason, um, and it's, to my mind, um, only a natural reaction uh, that certain members of human society, such as the creationists, would react in the way that they are to the scientific attempt to reduce culture to a material process. Um, I'm not defending creationism, I'm just saying any scientist who tries to reduce moral, morality to uh, natural selection has to expect that uh, some members of, of their society will react in the way that creationists are reacting. Um, I think we need to acknowledge all of Aristotle's causes if we want a truly deep understanding of reality. Uh, you know, it'd be nice and simple if everything could be reduced to one type of causality, to the material causes, but it, it just seems like reality is turning out to be a bit more complex than that. So, I think, you know, it's, it's, it becomes clear when you consider that science is one form of human culture. It's one way that humans know the world, and in fact, it's a pretty creative, uh, a pretty wonderful way of doing so. But we cannot use this way of knowing to then loop back on ourselves and explain how it is that we become creative in this way. We cannot use Darwin's theory of natural selection, which is itself an artifact of a culture, in order to explain that culture. Um, we can certainly use it to gain insights into the culture, but not to explain it away or to reduce it to a purely material or mechanistic cause. So. Hopefully that makes sense, and uh, thanks again for your video, Karen, and I look forward to discussing evolutionary biology with you again. Uh, it's a great and uh, interesting topic, so thanks for listening.